U.S. State Department messages concerning the CIA have been made public by the Iranians in the American embassy. These documents have been displayed on Iranian television and also given to the international press, including the United States. Have you seen any on television? Or in the press anywhere? Well, tonight we'll have a show and tell on Alternative Views News Magazine. We focus tonight on two of the most serious situations in the world today, Iran and Afghanistan. We have two people who have been intimately involved in the situation in Iran. Lisa Radcliffe, an American, has just come back from an extensive trip to Iran and has some of those documents we were talking about a while ago. And also, Kazem Allah, a poet, a political dissident who was incarcerated and tortured for a year by the Shah. This interview we have with him is very strong stuff. Well, I won't go. It, it certainly drained me, and it will give you an idea of what it was like to be an Iranian under the Shah. But first, Afghanistan. Doug, you have some material, do you not? Well, within the mass media, there have been few sober, rational, and moderate appraisals of the situation. So I was surprised to find that the Wall Street Journal had perhaps one of the more rational accounts that put down, that downplayed the dangers that were posed to the United States and the so-called free world from the Russian invasion in Afghanistan. The Wall Street Journal said straight out in their headlines, that new military thrusts by the Russians are doubted and said in the first sentence that Moscow is unlikely to carry its military adventures much further anytime soon. They, they stated both American and European scholars and stated forthrightly that there was little danger that the Soviet Union would invade targets like Iran, Pakistan, or the Persian Gulf. They pointed out that for one thing, Moscow may have its hands full in Afghanistan now, and they're not going to have the ability to carry on any more military adventures because they're going to have to put so much of their energy and resources in quelling the uh, rebellions in Afghanistan. Indeed, one of Carter's advisors say, and I quote the Wall Street Journal again, I think they'll pause and digest Afghanistan. The Soviets want to expand, but probably without paying big costs. Moreover, another one of the top analysts at the Institute of International Studies in Geneva added, again quoted in the Wall Street Journal, I don't think this is the beginning of a great Soviet expansion using military power. They're not risk takers in international relations. They will watch all opportunities and take advantage of whatever opportunity they can. Frank, you have some uh, more information in an article from The Nation right. that um, also raises questions whether there is a major threat to American interest there or anything out of the ordinary. Right. The um, writer says that the situation in Afghanistan is really not uh, all that significant. He says it is significant in the sense that it's an occasion for some of the most undiluted irresponsibility and crass demagoguery on the part of the U.S. administration for a long, long time. They said that the Soviets have had friendly relations with Afghanistan, close relationships for many, many years. And particularly since uh, 1955, Afghanistan has been militarily dependent on the USSR. Um, 
and there were Soviet-backed regimes before, and the one which was just deposed was uh, completely intolerable. The people didn't support it, and so the Soviets came in to restore order. And they said this was, this was the case, not a long, gradual, uh, strategic advance all over the rest of the globe, as we're being told all the time. Uh, they are not interested in going to the Persian Gulf or gobbling up Iran for a lot of reasons, one of which is the Soviets are the number one producers of oil in the world. They don't need all that extra down there right now, at least. I have another point on this. There has been a lot of uh, concern that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan would lead to an invasion of Iran since there's a border between Iran and Afghanistan. What these reports omit, and this is pointed out in the Wall Street Journal, is that there's the Himalaya Mountains between Afghanistan and Iran, that it would be very difficult for the Soviet Union to go across these mountains to invade Iran. Moreover, the Soviets already have a border with Iran on the north, which is a flat area that with good roads that they could easily, they could have at any time gone down and gobbled up the oil in the Persian uh, Gulf in the south of Iran if this was their uh, intention. There's another aspect of this which is reported by the right-wing newspaper, The Spotlight, and that is uh, or the rather ironic the fact that the trucks which the Soviets used to go move into Iran were made in the Kama River plant, which on the face of it isn't much. However, the Kama River plant was built with the money and the uh, technical assistance of the United States multinational corporations and the consortium of banks. Uh, the writer also points out that the reason you don't see the financial sanctions of the type uh, to take retaliation against Iran being used against the Soviet Union is that the, the two economies are very much intertwined and uh, to do that would have a severe repercussions on the Western economy as well as in the Soviet Union. He says that the uh, flow of credit from the West to the Eastern European states and the Soviet Union is up to 65 billion now. So if they monkeyed with that, it would be default on a massive scale and be uh, quite significant, uh, create quite significant problems for the, particularly the banking community. Let me just uh, conclude this with a frightening a quote from the Village Voice to show what's at stake. They cite that nuclear war has become more likely now than at any time since the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis. They also point out something that a few weeks ago there was a computer error that created a six-minute fail-safe alert. That a computer indicated that the bombs were on its way and we were in the fail-safe situation so that the defense establishment was steeled for the final nuclear um, holocaust. It's frightening. Speaking of frightening, let's find out what's been happening in Iran. How long were you in Iraq? I was there for a little over three weeks. And where all did you go? Uh, the, we traveled mainly around Tehran, the city of Tehran. I was there in 1978 and traveled throughout Iran, but at this, for this trip we were mainly in Tehran. Do you speak Farsi? I took a, um, about a year of Persian at mm. UC Berkeley. I speak sort of passable dinner table Persian. So that you're, you're pretty familiar with Iran then. Mm -hmm. You're just not somebody who dropped in over there and came back and suddenly is an instant expert no. on it. Well, and so now you're traveling around and telling people what you got and mm -hmm. having a show and tell program. You've got some documents here. Yes. Why don't you show us what they have? You got these from the students at the... At the t embassy in Tehran, the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. These are documents that were released by the students at the embassy and they were released to the media and yet they've been suppressed. I don't think that people have really gotten a chance to read through these because they're very incriminating. This one, this whole group of documents here, is very, they're very interesting. They're a series of things for cover considerations, this one here. This man, Paul Timmermans, apparently his cover is a commercial business representative and he was born in Belgium. Was he with the CIA? <coughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, they're discussing how he should uh, uh, you know, this is his, his background information that mm -hmm. he should be aware of and what have you. This is not unusual, though, or really not surprising that there are CIA people over there. There's CIA people and intelligence people in every embassy. Oh, no, I don't think it's a big surprise. See, the CIA in Iran was not just reading newspapers or <sighs> doing this and that. They were actually engaging in 
in sabotage, engaging in, during the time of the Shah, that they would follow Iranian dissidents. They would turn them in, and these people, you know, were tortured to death or put in prison and what have you. But when I talked to the students at the embassy, they had found uh, loads and loads of counterfeit Iranian money that was going to be used to flood the Iranian economy and wreck it. They found uh, electronic spy equipment, all of the things that we are sure exist inside the embassy, but, uh, you know, are used against the Iranian people. I think another one of the significant things that the U.S. Embassy was used for is that it was a central organizing place for subversion and counter-revolution in Iran. And then by that, I mean that certain embassy officers, their job was to go out to different forces before the revolution, after, during the revolution, and after the revolution that were loyal to the Shah, and to organize them around the, the U.S.'s plans for a coup. Well, hey, let's get to our, well, back to some more goodies here. What you got? Well, this one here was written in September 30th, 1979, and it basically is a discussion on bringing the Shah, it's subject Shah of Iran, and it's a discussion between the State Department, it's emanating from the embassy to the State Department, and it says, this, I think this is a very interesting paragraph, paragraph four says, given the kind of atmosphere and the kind of public posturing about the Shah by those who control or influence public opinion here, I doubt that the Shah being ill would have any ameliorating effect on the degree of reaction here. It would presumably make our own position more defensible if we were seen to admit him under demonstrably humanitarian considerations. So it was being arranged uh, way ahead of time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in fact, you know, this is, again, this whole question of the Shah's illness, which was the cover for bringing him into the United States, this really, to, to a large degree, blows that away in the sense that it's, it's clear that what they were trying to figure out is what kind of face to put on mm -hmm. his being brought here. Um, this one here is particularly interesting because it um, is a communique between Sullivan and the head of the Bank of Amran. Sullivan now is who, I forget? Sullivan was the ambassador to Iran during oh. the time of the Shah. And um, he was there until the, you know, the completion, to a certain degree, the completion of that portion of the revolution in which the Shah was forced to flee the country. The Bank of Amran is the Shah's personal bank. Okay, and what Sullivan is instructing this man to do is to go into that, um, to the Bank of Amran, which is now being controlled by young, enthusiastic, sort of revolutionary-minded Iranians, and uh, sort of go in there and, and, cre and wreak havoc within this bank. Right. A lot of places I go, people say, are these really real? And I feel like saying, well, what do you think I did? I went home and got seven different typewriters and, and fabricated <laughs> these documents. What purpose would that serve? Yeah. And that they're always referred to in, in the sort of the normal, the big press or what have you, yeah. as the alleged documents, these so-called unauthenticated um, documents. I have to share you with other media here in Austin. You have to go, but I hope yes, you... Thank you very much for having me. ...come back again. This is really great. Thank you very much. Bye. Lisa Radcliffe. So frequently in the media or in discussions or in the press, we see things like, well, so-and-so was a prisoner of the Shah. What was that really like? You know, it's one thing to kind of, well, he was a prisoner, he was in jail. What was it really like? What does it do to a person? And what is the Iranian situation like now and then? It's difficult for us to get good information in the United States because it's filtered through the regular establishment media mainly. But now we don't need that filtering because we have Kazem Allah, who is a poet, writer, former political prisoner of the Shah, now living in Houston. And we'll discuss all these subjects with him. And with us is Christy Birdfeather, who's with crime, nothing illegal, it just means the coalition against racism and intervention in the Middle East. They are very active on the campus of the university. Kazem, in a way, I hesitate to ask you some of these questions because I know it must be very painful for you. But can we go back a few years ago? What was it like in Iran when the Shah was there? I began to be active in politics when I was in the 10th grade of high school. And we used to have this kind of secret meetings in our houses talking politics and uh, different subjects. 
then we began to take it to the high school like uh, we used to have this wall newspaper in a wallpaper and I used to put my poetry on it so they began to suppress it and they expelled me from you know high school for that reason the school was uh, suppressing it yes okay. but it was mainly because you know Savak was controlling everything there there were these uh, supervision committees in every school supervision committees of Savak the secret police in every school, in every school. I mean, not only schools and factories, I mean, in, uh, everywhere, offices, you know, they had these supervision committees that they were just having files on everybody's activity. And they several times warned me that to not do that one time. They got me when I was entering the, you know, school just before I, we had an exam. In high school? In high school, and they told me that if uh, you go ahead, we'll arrest you and we'll do that and this to you and they were just intimidating me and then when you got to college you continued your political activity yes when I entered the college uh, <laughs> just uh, three months after I entered the college I got arrested what was the pretext they gave that we had uh, this uh, mountain climbing organization in university kind of a sport organization which was by the way illegal because Every kind of, you know, uh, organization were illegal, especially in universities. And we had these several students on a team going to mountain climbing near Tehran. And they were lost. And we knew they were lost. And we called the, you know, police stations to get their help, to send some helicopters and get them. It was in winter. And <coughs> excuse me. They didn't give us any damn help. And then we sent another team and we found their dead bodies they were frozen you sent a team of students yes mm -hmm. team of students and when we brought their bodies i mean everybody was outraged because they could have sent helicopter and saved their lives they didn't do that and we had this funeral at uh, a mosque called ark mosque and the mosque was in the center of tehran near the bazaar and lots of students several thousand I can say from all universities came to that funeral and uh, the army and the police were surrounding us and they attacked us they killed one student and arrest arrested about 300 persons including you including me and it was about Christmas time and you know Tehran was very cold they stripped us they beat the hell out of us they, they beat, beat you with what the flag with whips. Oh. Yes, with cable actually. They cable. With cable. This thick, I mean, probably uh, three fourths of an inch thick. And uh, they shaved our, you know, hair and just make us look very ugly and they beat the hell out of us. All over your body? All over or? our body. Well, it was funny. The everybody, every of these Sawak people torturers would come and just to, to have fun it was they were enjoying it just to punch or to get one but somebody's ear and pull and uh, do all you know i mean they were just sadists you know they loved it and there was this guy called hosseini who used to just love torturing he was saying you know they called me hosseini and have you heard my name? I kill people under the torture. I burn them. So just tell me the truth. Do not, you know, pay, play around with me. And, you know, just that kind of thing. And when you said, well, I don't have nothing to say. I don't know why you have arrested me. Okay. And they would put you on these beds or, ch you know, chairs, special chair. Beat the hell out of you or make you naked and, you know, do, do all kinds of crazy things. But uh, that first time they couldn't keep us more than two months because first of all it was mass errors and all the universities went on strike. I mean, <laughs> then the bazaar in Tehran went on strike to our support and then there were this all kinds of solidarity messages from factories and so they really got harassed. They really were scared to keep us. So after two months, 
they freed most of us. They kept several, but they freed most of us. They had, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, eyes on us. Even they, uh, you know, they. I mean, after you, after they released you, they still. Yes. Followed you and kept track of what you were doing. Yes, I believe so because. Uh, the second time that I got arrested, about 11 months after I was freed, they knew pretty, I mean, not all of I did, but they knew a lot where I went. Even they knew sometimes that what kind of movies I watched, you know. Did they have surveillance on your friends also? I believe so, because they arrested several of my friends too. So after you got out, after, what, two months the first time? Months, then you went back to days. the university. They didn't want to accept us at the university. At the university, and uh, but th you know our fellow students went on strike, so they accepted us under this condition that any time we s hear something against the government, we have to report it to Sawak, and if they catch us on something, then we hereby admit that uh, they can do whatever they want to do. So that was the condition in which they accepted you back into the school. You had to become a Savak informer. Well, we didn't sign that. Uh -huh. We didn't sign that. Nobody signed that. We stayed away from university for about two or three weeks. So they softened their position because the university was still on strike and our fellow students wanted us in. So they just got this uh, piece of paper that I promise to not get involved in politics and sign it. So then they wanted our parents to co-sign it. Oh. So I, I mean, and then parents came and co-signed it and then they let us in. <coughs> that was it. But they, they, we were on surveillance. We had several times, we were several times raided on you know campus badly I mean really badly people got killed raided by by Sawak Sawak and, and the army and the army the, when they raided the campus they could get anybody no matter he, he or she was involved in demonstration or they would just get anybody that they get they just make these raids raids and get and and just them and arrest them and yes and uh, several of our students, you know, got refuge on the roofs, mm -hmm. the fifth floor, the sixth floor. They threw them away, just threw them like garbage down. down. And many people got killed that way. Many people had broken legs or arms or, you know, you know, just to say that any time you protest something, that's, the, you know, the response you get. So just shut up. And uh, they did several times that and several times they raided the dormitories and but well, I didn't get arrested I mean we escaped so you managed to not get arrested for what another 11 months 11 months and what was the reason you were arrested uh, and in prison the second time the second time uh, we had this fellow students getting killed on the dormitory and uh, we just overnight we decided to make a funeral for him and I went door by door with several other students and raised money and got people's you know uh, support and asked them to come and participate and he was you know a native of Isfahan we had to go to that city we moved overnight we went to that city and with the help of the Isfahan University students, we organized a funeral. Funeral was, you know, forbidden. We couldn't have funeral and getting the body into the cemetery. It was against the law. It was public gathering against the law. Even, e even the funeral was considered yes. a public gathering and yes. was against the law. Yes. You couldn't, you know, walk in the streets, you know, with, you know, people more than five or ten. So uh, the police was everywhere to prevent us, but uh, we really organized that. We got lots of support, and people just were pissed off this kind of, you know, 
operation. They joined us. I mean, the past surprise that they didn't know who was killed, and we were saying, you know, everybody joined the funeral. Yes, procession and it suddenly grew. I mean, they couldn't attack it, and it mm -hmm. was just great. I mean, th then we began to say slogans against the Shah. I mean, mm -hmm. we turned it to an entire Shah demonstration, mm -hmm. and when we went to symmetry, we read some statements just talking to people and when we went back uh, for about a week and they began to arrest everybody who was suspicious in you know being involved or organizing this uh, funeral and they got me but the main they, they first did not ask about that funeral they were just saying okay now what kind of affiliation do you have with this guerrilla movement? They were just torturing me for those reasons. You are a poet and you are radical. Why did you uh, write your poetry for your, you know, friends? You were you instigating riots? I mean, just this kind of questions. So they were trying to get you to uh, confess to various types of activity, which you may or may not even have been involved in. That's true, and uh, the way they began to. Uh, as they put it themselves, to work on me was and is something that I can never forget. I mean, it's just like a continuous nightmare. First, they made me completely naked and they searched everywhere. I mean, just humiliating, you know, just playing with your body and not only searching. And. <laughs> Then they threw me to this solitary and they said, okay, now you have 24 hours to say everything yourself. Otherwise, uh, then we'll work on you. We know how to make you confess. And it was not just 24 hours. It was just being in the center of these torture chambers, hearing all of these cries and screams coming everywhere. I, mean, I couldn't sleep for a minute at 24 hours because of this I mean you are in the solitary and this guy is screaming kill me don't do that just kill me and this I mean screams all over it fill your ears and uh, once in a while this guard coming and looking through that hole to you and or suddenly opening to the what you're doing and this kind of you know just harassing you. Then the next day, in the morning, they took me to this room that was filled with blood, you know, very low ceiling, and there was this bed filled with blood, and blood all over, I mean, scabs, you know, I mean, this dried blood everywhere, and this smelled dirty, filthy. And they fastened me, my hands and my legs, to, the, you know, to the that bed, half naked, and then this uh, torturer that first came and introduced himself, his name was Karimi, I, I believe. It was his nickname, <laughs> it wasn't his real name, came and said, you know, I am Karimi, and I have killed lots of people who resisted to confess. Now, if you be a good boy, you just say whatever you did. We know everything about you. You just want to hear it from your own mouth. And, uh, but if you are a bad boy, then I can't promise that you get away alive from here. So I said, well, I don't know what you are talking about. I never did a bad thing or an illegal thing. So they called this uh, boy, he was a young, probably 18, 90 years old soldier and they gave him cable. There were several cables with different, you know, width, and he was just playing with me. Okay, do you want this thick or this cable or that cable? And they gave one of them to that and said, okay, whip him. <coughs> they whipped so bad. They whipped me about a hundred flags and I get unconscious and they poured water on me. And especially when they poured water on my legs, which were blo bleeding and 
the blood was springing all over the ceiling and everywhere. It really was painful. The cold blood, you know, cold water on the wounds, and then they kicked me and forced me to walk, jump on my legs, and then they repeated that. Uh, I, I I didn't say anything, and this continued for the whole day until evening. They just continued beating they you or beat doing other things? They, they did other things, like uh, he left the room, this carry me guy, and told this soldier, okay, uh, try to get something out of his mouth, I'll be back. And when carry me left the, the room and, you know, closed the door, the soldier was just like finding kind of bonanza, just, you know, was getting my testicles and just putting, you know, his hands on my mouth and just opening my mouth and, I mean, just like animal. I couldn't believe that, you know, I'm, you know I mean, there is a man or a human being, you know. Uh, it was just like animal, just, and he tore my bodies with his nails and, and it was, uh, then, uh, it's difficult for you to talk about it. It's a horrible experience. You don't have to if you don't want to, if you really want to. I have a duty to say these things for American people to know what was life on the shore. So, anyway, after about half an hour, I was so badly screaming that this carry me came and just slapped in the face that soldier said, we, we have not taken any word out of his mouth. We want him alive. We don't want to kill him now. He was really killing me. And <coughs> they gave me a break for about two hours. And then they again began, started again weeping and uh, like they did something with my fingers that I was thinking that they were breaking it. I, I don't know how they did it, but I mean, the pain was scratching all over my bones. It was awful, and then they couldn't get any word, and I was bleeding all over. My nose was bleeding, my mouth was bleeding, blood was all over my body, and so they thought that's enough for that day. Then uh, they asked me to walk to my solitary. I couldn't walk, so uh, I sat and somebody got my uh, calf and pulled me all the way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To the solitary. And then they began this. I mean, they didn't stop torturing just taking me to solitary. They didn't let me sleep for five continuous days and nights. Uh, anytime I kind of fell to sleep, somebody came and slapped me very bad on the face, so I came back. Then this continued. The next day they again took me to that chamber, and this time they handcuffed me this way, and uh, there was this hook, that they hooked me to that, and they could raise it, so I could be kind of hanged off the my hands, and the pain all over, uh, and they did it several times, then they threatened me with raping me. Raping you? They threatened, they didn't rape, but they threatened. Oh, pretend they were going to? Yes, they pretend they are going to rape me. They made me naked, and uh, there were these drunk torturers coming in, playing and saying, okay, you are, you want to, you know, have fun with you. And, well, I was so torn that I wouldn't 
I mean, it wouldn't make any difference for me because I was thinking that I'm gonna die in an hour or so. I was thinking, uh, so I didn't react it that oh, so you are then going to do such a terrible thing to me. I just looked at. Them. So they saw no reaction. No, th it was probably just kind of saying, okay. You're in a state of shock. Yeah. Then anyway. yeah. So they didn't do it, but. Then <coughs> I was, y you know, for 47 days in that solitary, very filthy, small solitary. I couldn't go to bathroom. I didn't take a shower for, for the whole time, and I was stinky. Blood was dried. Blood was all over my body. I didn't have control over my body. I urinated blood and threw up blood and. Uh, uh, they were uh, uh, these horrible moments at uh, in the middle of the night. They would sometimes come and wake you up and say, "Okay, and your execution order has been issued. Now come with us and just blindfold you and take you to." place that you hear, you know, gunshot and gunfire, and sometimes close you to a, you know, bar to something, three eye, eye because you were blindfolded. I, d I couldn't realize what was that. Well, they would tie you to a, tie you to to some a tree or s a post or something. And then you, you were, I mean, you, you were ready that you get killed, and you were, I, I was willing to get killed. I mean, I was so much under pressure and pain that death would be, I mean, just a relief. And then, uh, then they take you back to, the, to your solitary, do nothing, you know, just psychological effect. And I remember that then my, my wounds on my palms began to infect. And I several times knocked the door and asked them for medical care. They came and beat me instead of giving medical care. Then, uh, by that time, they couldn't have gotten anything wo any word against me. They f forced some some of my friends to confess things against me that I did not admit. And uh, I was fortunate that when they arrested me, everybody knew I was arrested. So my friends went to my house and just emptied. They didn't, you know, left anything for the Sawak. The Sawak later searched it, but they didn't give anything. When you were in <coughs> the cell, what kind of conditions were there? Were any rats or bugs or anything like that? Or was it oh. sealed off so at least we protected someone? Uh, it was very dirty. I had a uh, very bloody, stinky blanket and uh, that was the only thing I had no pillows nothing and <coughs> it was cold and roaches were everywhere that's don't I mean the horror of these roaches just walking through my wounds and you know eating my body was uh, uh, I can never recover from that. How were you finally released? Uh, well, for <coughs> I was in a very bad situation, that uh, solitary, and then they took me, these wounds were really being infected, so they cut the tissues with a scissor and <coughs> put some bandage and then took me to public, you know, prison out of solitary. I was there for about 10 months in the public <coughs> prison and... Uh, Did they continue beating you there or no, it was just a regular prison? No, but they had this uh, regular rates on the prison. They didn't have any, any 
pen or paper or something. So anytime they, every week or every other week, they would raid the prison and beat us and look for pen or pencil because they were afraid that somebody who had a visitor might have brought something. But it was impossible to bring a pen in. I had only two visits by my family. They didn't know that I was, j uh, I mean, I was alive. They, they were told that I was executed, and they were told that I was, you know, killed differently, not executed. I mean, they were saying all these kinds of lies to my family, and several times my family came, went, came and asked to visit me. They beat them, and uh, they beat your parents they beat when they came to, to visit me, and just harassing that your son was an, a gorilla and a terrorist and he's killed and now if you come one more time here we'll take you to the same place and this kind of harassment and uh, I ha after seven months I had a visit and but for one thing they got I mean, they were crying when they saw me, but it was just something for them that they saw me alive. I couldn't walk, you know, for for one year, and I couldn't really walk and run and like a normal person, you know. These bones still, you know, my palm are still kind of strange. They are not not smooth, you know. If you examine them, they, they are like small heels all over it because they cut the tissues and heat very badly. Then after 11 months, I got a trial, which a was pretty funny. A trial? Mili in military court, without representation. and <coughs> I mean, that was just a mockery of trial. My l The guy that was supposed to defend me was a major, a colonel in the army, and he came and told the other judges who were also military officers, and told them, it was a secret tribunal, and he told them, well, I believe that this boy is guilty, I'm ashamed to represent him. We feed them, we give them education, and now they protest. I mean, he was worse than the prosecutor. So they convicted me to two years in jail. I appealed, and uh, it was by the time that <coughs> the international pressure was really on, on the Shah and his regime to release his political prisoners, and there were protests all over the world. So the second time, I had this chance to have a civil attorney mm -hmm. and he decreased the conviction by one year but after one year they didn't release me they were saying well we are not going to release you because you didn't confess did they still beat you during that year or they just <coughs> keep you locked up no they didn't beat me they just keep me locked up and uh, so after my conviction was over my sentence was over for 10 days every day they took me to the you know what we call call it basement, just to talk me some way, you know, just telling me we won't release you unless you sign that you will cooperate with the Sawak. And it was the same time that several other of my friends were also being released, and they would take us together and you know just be nice, you know, see if you we can release you, we can pay you a good salary. You can be have a good position after you graduate and all of these kind of if things. If you cooperate with if the If you Sabak. cooperate, so then we, we said no. We thank you, and they said, well, okay, now we won't let you out, or even if you were out, you won't be accepted in uh, you know college again. So we were saying all of us that we don't want to go back to that college. We want to find some job and. You know, just anything they said, we refused. They said, we won't let you in the college. Okay, we, we are not going back to college anyway. And they said, we won't let you to work anywhere. 
experience. Okay, my f I said I am going to help my father in his job. I am not worried about finding a job. You cannot tell my father to not give me a job. So then, after this ten days conversation and taking us and back and forth, they forced us to sign these things. That okay, we release you under this condition that every month. You report to police. You where were you? Who were you contacted with? You know where did you go and these kind of things. And if you wanted to move from one city to another city, you have to report. We signed that, but we never really, you know, mm -hmm. did that. Nobody reported. So that was the reason that after they and uh, they released us the second time. Every other month, they used to come and pick us at the gate of the university or somewhere in between the university and the house and just, you know, interrogate for one hour or two hours. Where were you? <coughs> well, these activities that you were involved in, which were the pretense for getting you arrested, <coughs> were activities that were happening all over Iran at the time. Yes. With hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. Well, we and had hundreds of thousands of pe political prisoners, too. And the the number of people who were tortured, imprisoned and tortured under the Shah, also must have reached, uh, from what I've read, uh, hundreds of thousands yes. of people. Uh, if you were lucky enough to stay on a cross intersection and not get arrested, mm -hmm. not because if you were staying for no reason someplace, they would get suspicious and think that you have a date with a gorilla or... Because they were suspicious, uh, they... they logic was that we are suspicious of anybody on this. The opposite is proved. Everybody is guilty unless it's, you know, I mean, the con contrary is proved, the opposite is proved. So if you had to stay, um, you know, could stay one place and one day you would see the subway cars passing by and just picking up the youth for no reason or searching them on the wall and take him and I mean just those people would disappear. The Shah spent several times more on building prisons than building libraries or schools or from this revenue. And uh, we ha in every major city we had big prisons, camps really, big prisons, thousands of prison prisoners. And in in only Tehran, we had three big prisons, four. And uh, in my prison, probably, we estimated there were about 7,000. So if you just see, in Tehran, there were about something like 25,000 prisoners. And they were only the prisoners who were in the prisons. The Sawak had these headquarters in every other neighborhood, or, you know, just different headquarters that they had. Again, you know, death chambers, and you know, that many of them were exposed after the revolution. People just found them with dead bodies all over, with torture tools everywhere. So I, I want to say, if in one city you have 25 estimate, rough estimate, 25 or 30 thousand prisoners, then we had so many prisons all over the Iran. We had big prisons, with thousands of prisons in Mashhad. We had, we had huge prison in Isfahan, which Isfahan was a working class, you know, city, and there were unrest there. So just to show you how big the, this prison in Isfahan was, the, the buildings for the personnel of the prison was enough for a thousand families. The just for the people who ran the prison, the prison themselves was enough for a thousand families? You got to see this still there in Isfahan. Mm. Um, so you can have you know, an estimate of the dimension of the prison. And then we had prison in Khash, we had prisons. I mean, probably in 100 cities we had prisons. So just get an estimate. Yeah. <laughs> it was awful. Well, it's no wonder then that the people of Iran mistrust the U.S. government a wee bit. Well, because they uh, because it was the U.S. government all this time, the CIA was supporting and training Sabak in the exactly. U.S. They were supporting and training the army, and the 
government was supporting the policies of the Shah right up to the end. Yes, you never heard anything about uh, Shah, uh, what was Shah doing in, the, in Iran. You never heard anything here in mass media here in the United States. They were all supporting him. He was really a puppet for their interest. He was doing good for them. and. Uh, and the multinational corporations and the multinational yes. banks, the Rockefeller banks, were just making billions of dollars out yes, of Yes, billions of, of dollars. And uh, for one thing, let me tell you this, that Americans in Iran, we were Iranian citizens, but we had second-class citizenship status comparing to Americans. There were places that there were no Iranians were allowed to go, bars or clubs you for mean Americans. Only Americans could go there? They had f facilities, I mean fascinating facilities. On a time that the housing was a major problem for Iranian people and families of 15 or 20 were living in one big room sh in shanty towns covered with this uh, metal plate and you know which is very hot in summer and very cold in winter and people freezing to death in winters. Shah was making, building beautiful apartments, beautiful villas for Americans. We had 40,000 military advisors, United States military advisors, training secret police. And uh, not only training the secret police and army, but actually helping him to, uh, you know, this finding the entire Shah fighters' places and gunning him down. And torturing them, tor training them, torture techniques. Just a few months ago, one of these torturers was confessing before the international journalists in Tehran, and he said that he got his trainees in the United States with several other torturers. They had this, they were all the way behind the shot, all the way back to him. And only when things, you know, were so bad that they couldn't hide it, they began to say, to portray what was going on in Iran, but in the way that, well, these fanatics are overthrowing a modernizer. Right. These crazy people are overthrowing our, this show is so wonderful, and these people are just fanatics, Muslim fanatics, crazy people. And just, even when they were, they were giving coverage about what was going on in Iran, they were giving this kind of coverage. And you find that when you came to the United States that most of the people agreed with this position, I assume. Most of the people thought the Shah was okay and that the... Most of the people that I saw, they were thinking that, or expressing it, they can't believe Shah was a bad, because all they have heard is that Shah was a great guy, modernizer. Everybody loved him in the country, and this only a few bunch of fanatics and communists. <laughs> I hate him. I have had really good uh, conversation with many Americans. For one thing, if they know the truth, they'll come and back us. You had the same thing happening in two centuries ago. You had uh, British Empire's domination here. You, had, you were oppressed, so that was the cause for the first revolution here. So it is not a crazy act to make a revolution when you want to get rid of a foreign country's domination and control over your lives. You also had your second revolution, the civil war, that broke out because, because of, you know, struggle for civil rights. And thousands of thousands of people shed their blood, and it was a crazy thing. So now that we are doing the same thing, and we are crazy, and you did that a hundred years ago, and it is, we shouldn't have this problem now. We should have get rid of our uh, tyrants and dictators 50 years ago. If it wasn't the United States government and other foreign countries' involvement in Iran. What about the Soviet Union and Iran? Uh, there's a lot of hysteria, war hysteria, Cold War hysteria, anti-Soviet. Imagine a lot of people would want, wonder what the relationship is with Iran and the Soviet Union. They say, oh, the Soviet Union has troops only 300 miles from the refineries, and the Soviets are going to move into Iran. What do you think about that? You know, any, any country who 
was uh, in the side of the Shah, people hated. Soviet Union's bureaucracy, at the time that Shah was massacring people, they're sending messages of congratulation for his birthdays. The and Soviet Union was yes, congratulating the Shah, right? Yes. So people, I mean, were identified these uh, bureaucrats with the Shah, and they hated them. I don't believe that Soviet Union has any intention to intervene in Iran. And uh, even though this, uh, uh, the gov present government of Iran tries to say so, to mobilize the people and say that um, now we are really in danger that Soviet Union is just 30 miles from us. Uh, but we had also 14. Hundred miles border with Soviet Union for cent I mean for all of our life and nothing happened. So they are not going to intervene. And I mean people are not that uh, you know uh, scared. In the Soviet Union, <coughs> right? The Russians saw what the Iranians, the Iranian people, did to the Shah. I'm sure they don't want to tackle that. Yes, they are not looking for problems. <laughs> no. Well, Kazem, I wish we could talk much longer about this. I know we're running out of time and you have to get back to Houston. I do want to thank you for sharing your experiences. I realize it was very painful for you and quite frankly it was painful for Christy and I to be here. I just hope like you say that the American people can hear and understand and appreciate what the Iranian people have gone through as a country as and as individuals, so they can understand the part that the U.S. government and the U.S. corporations have played in Iran. Just understand, that's about all you really want, isn't it? That's what I want, and I also want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. To say something, thank you very much. <laughs>